The synthesis of epoxides is going to be the topic of this lesson, and we'll review one old way. We'll cover a couple of new ones, including one that's pretty crafty. Uh, in the last lesson, we named epoxides. In the next one, we'll look at the, the reactions of epoxides. But in this one, we'll cover how you make an epoxide. Now, I'm currently adding a few lessons a week to this organic chemistry playlist, and if you'd like to be notified every time I post a lesson, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notification. All right, so a couple different ways, and we'll start with this first one here, and this is new, but it's really based off some things that are old. And so uh, in this case, it turns out you gotta have uh, a, an alcohol right next to an alkyl halide, and I show it on the ring here, because if it happens on a ring, they need to need to need to be trans to each other, because it's gonna involve backside attack, and you can only get to the backside on a ring if you're already on the backside, if you're trans here. And so the way this works, you need to add a strong base, and a bulky base is quite often used, like potassium t-butoxide, but technically if you use sodium hydroxide, it'll work as well. And what would happen in this case is you're just simply gonna deprotonate that alcohol. So you deprotonate that alcohol, and now you've got the corresponding alkoxide, which is a strong nucleophile. As an alcohol, it was a weak nucleophile, now it's a strong nucleophile, and it's already on, right near the backside of the adjacent carbon here. And so it's just going to do backside attack here and kick off the leaving group. And lo and behold, we formed our epoxide. Cool. So like I said, this is new. So, but deprotonating on alcohol, you learned that in the last chapter. So SN2, you learned that a while ago. And so even though the, the overall process is new here, so no, nothing new incorporated into the process. And one other thing, I want to kind of backtrack on this one one further step because you guys did learn how to end up with this, this exact kind of a scenario from an alkene. And if you do the addition of Br2 in water, so it'll add a Br and an OH, and it's anti-addition, so they end up trans to each other if that occurs on a ring. And so you, you learned how to turn an alkene into this. Now, the truth is, you might not end up doing this because the truth is you can turn an alkene into the epoxide in a single step. And you learned how to do that as well. And in this case, I'm gonna use MCPBA, metachloroperoxybenzoic acid, which is an example of a peroxy acid or per acid for short. You guys might recall, and this is total review. So, we went through the mechanism way back in the alkene chapter, and I won't review that here, So, but just another way to make that epoxide as well. So, And now we're going to cover what's called the Sharpless oxidation, So, which is a rather crafty way so, to make enantiomeric forms of epoxides and to get one enantiomer instead of the other, instead of a racemic mixture as well. All right, so let's talk about that Sharpless epoxidation here. And, uh, the Sharpless epoxidation is specifically for allylic alcohols. So if you notice here, I've got uh, alkene right here, and the next carbon over, that's the allylic carbon, and it is that carbon that has to have the hydroxyl group attached. So it could have been any one of these three carbons technically in this case. And uh, the Sharpless epoxidation is really nifty because the truth is, uh, in this case, we can form a couple of different enantiomers here. So let's take a look here. We get this guy and then the allylic alcohol part over here. So where it turns out the enantiomer with the allylic alcohol now on the wedge. And so these two epoxides are enantiomers and normally if you just use MCPBA or something like that, you get both. So, however, the Sharpless epoxidation allows you to get one versus the other, and this is kind of a big deal. Being able to produce just a single enantiomer in a reaction, uh, again, is a big deal, and most of the time, most of the reactions we do are going to form racemic mixtures. So, but this is a big deal, like, you know, you might recall back in the 70s with thalidomide, and one enantiomer uh, had a certain effect, and the other one caused birth defects and things of this sort. So, uh, you know, if you can get one enantiomer versus another, it's kind of a big deal, and people used to get Nobel Prizes for this kind of thing and stuff. So. And it turns out the way this works, uh, if you want to form a single chiral enantiomer, well, then you have to have a chiral environment. And it turns out this proceeds with a chiral catalyst. And so it turns out this lovely titanium complex with diethyl tartrate uh, turns out forms a chiral catalyst. And it turns out we use two different uh, enantiomers of diethyl tartrate. So this is... Uh, 
uh, picture of diethyl tartrate right here, and depending on your wedges and your dashes, there's a MISO version, and then there's an RR version, an SS version. So but rather than looking at those configurations, we just look at the plus versus the minus, kind of which way it rotates light. And so it turns out if you use plus diethyl tartrate, you only get one of the enantiomers. And if you use minus diethyl titrate, you only get the other enantiomer. Now here's the pain in the butt with this though. The pain in the butt is knowing how to predict the stereochemistry of your product. And you'll see this presented in a variety of ways and it's just a nightmare. So here's the deal and here's what I recommend. So take your alkene and draw it vertical and you'll have four things coming off that alkene. Make sure the allylic alcohol is in the upper right. So whatever alkene you get, make sure it's in the upper right, just like I've done in both these examples. And if you need to rotate it and turn it, do so. When it's like this, so then your plus diethyl tartrate. So form your epoxide off to the right with wedges when you're using plus diethyl titrate. Form it off to the right with dashes when you're using minus diethyl tartrate. That's the deal. So like I said, you'll see this presented a variety of ways, but getting the three-dimensionality down, uh, three dimensionality down from your reactant relative to your product, it is a pain in the butt. And memorizing, you know, like I said, this is just one method for how to kind of associate it. So, but for those of you that have learned the, the sharpless oxidation, this is the kind of pain you got to go through. And hopefully that makes it just a wee bit easier. Now, some of you won't even see this reaction, but a great many will. It's, it's the standard part of a lot of, uh, you know, the epoxide curriculum in a lot of textbooks and in a lot of courses. Cool, and that's it for the synthesis of ethers. If you've found this lesson helpful, can I ask you a favor? Would you give me a like and a share? That really is uh, one of the best things you can do to help enable other students to see this lesson. If you are looking for practice materials, if you're looking for the study guide that goes with this lesson, if you're looking for final exam reviews, anything of this sort, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com. A free trial is available. Mm -hmm.